All right, thanks for joining me tonight, guys. I'm Corey Probst. I'm the wellness director here at the Diet Doc. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, for those of you who are joining us from afar, thank you for being here. Tonight we are going to talk about emotional metabolism. And a month ago, Joe spent some time really delving into what physiological metabolism is, right? He went through the processes in the body and uh, how your food is digested appropriately and how that's all related to fat loss. Well, we also digest our emotions. Well, some of us do. And some of us do it better or more effectively than others, right? Those of us who have difficulties digesting our emotions tend to move towards, and if we're talking about emotional eating or just the eating realm in general, we tend to move towards what people like to call emotional eating, stress eating, going into food binges when we're uncomfortable, right? And You've also probably heard of it talked about in the terms of stress eating. We're uncomfortable, we want to avoid the emotion that we're experiencing, we want to get out of this, we want to push it away, and so what do we do? For some reason we go towards food. For some reason that is what we choose to distract us a little bit from what we're feeling. That's not digesting our emotions. While physiological digestion is more automatic, our bodies just kind of know what to do, right? We eat the food, it's assimilated, our blood sugar rises, right? Insulin is released, you guys know the drill. But emotional metabolism and emotional digestion is much more active we have to really sink into a process and we have to be present and we have to be aware in order to really discern for ourselves what's happening. Otherwise, and like you've heard me call it before in previous lectures, we end up going into what's called zombie land. Okay, just kind of a fun way of describing automatic pilot mode. We go through the day not really thinking about what we're doing, not really paying attention, checking things off our to-do list, walking by the break room and grabbing the donut and shoving it down our throats and not even really paying attention to what we just ate, eating while we're in the car, eating while we're sitting at our computers, eating while we're watching TV, and we look down and our food is gone. And we wonder where it went. Well, it's here, <laughs> and it's here, and it's everywhere we don't want it to be. <laughs> and so what we're going to talk about tonight and really delve into is not only how we do have the ability to build the skills to be more aware of our emotions, but impact our metabolisms by the way in which we interact with our emotions. They've done studies that actually show that when we are engaged in what is called a, a dichotomous mode, so say that I'm standing here and then two of you guys decide to talk to me at the same time, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out like where to direct my attention, who do I listen to? because I can only really absorb one of you at a time, right? I can only assimilate the information that one of you gives me at a time. Well, they did a study where you know, they had two different groups of people. They had a control group, like they typically do in double-blind studies, and, they, and then they had the group that um, is being given the condition. Well, they had one group who wasn't getting this feedback from two people and then one group who was, but they had both groups drink a solution and then they measured how much of the solution, um, the minerals and, and vitamins that were in the solution were actually assimilated and, and digested and absorbed. Guess how much was absorbed by the individuals who 
had to try to direct their attention and were, and were distracted. Guess how much? How much? 50%? OK. Anyone else? Less? What would you say? 25%. OK, we're getting lower and lower. The answer is zero. Zero percent. This is how important being able to digest your emotions and assimilate your emotions and direct your attention to where you want it to go is. All right? Living in zombie land <laughs> doesn't bode well not only for your body, but for your mind, too. How many of you have had to, in terms of engaging in what's important as you move toward a goal, have done it just kind of willy-nilly and not really thinking and not really planning or anticipating and directing your attention anywhere? How many of you have met big, significant goals acting that way? Zero, again? <laughs> OK. That's how important it is. I want to talk to you tonight about a tool that I've developed based on mindfulness and emotional awareness skills. And I want you to walk away with something that's very practical that you can begin using immediately to when you notice that you're uncomfortable. And when you are kind of going a little bit internal and you're thinking about your thoughts, because that's really what mindfulness is. It's being aware of where your awareness is. And I know that can sound kind of confusing and convoluted. But we have, as human beings, an ability that no other animal does. And it's that. It's insight. It's being able to say, I'm thinking about this, and now I'm thinking about the way that I'm thinking about this. That's what mindfulness is. It's being able to observe our thinking. How am I actually processing this? It's much more about process versus content. I can sit in a meeting with someone. I can just be having a conversation with someone, right? And I can be listening to what the person's saying to me. I can listen to the words. I can listen to the story and the content of what this person is sharing with me. But I can also dive a little deeper and get underneath how this person is sharing this information with me. What tone of voice is this person using with me? What are the emotions that are underneath the words. Does that make sense? That's where we really get into what mindfulness and awareness skills are on a very much more personal level. You guys having that ability when you notice, for example, that like you're barely breathing, you're stressed out, and it's the body, guys. It's our external selves that typically will clue us in. We may be pacing back and forth. Someone will say to us, what's wrong? Are you OK? Because they can see it. You wear signals on the outside of your bodies that say, I'm experiencing something. <laughs> but most of the time, we're not paying attention. Now, on the inside, too, I know, for example, that when I get stressed and when I get nervous, like my chest gets tight. And if I sink into that feeling and, and I think, like, OK, what's going on for me right now? This is me being aware of this present moment. I recognize, too, that I'm barely breathing. I'm almost hyperventilating. There's no oxygen penetrating my lungs like they could be. And so I'm in stress mode, right? I'm like, go, 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 got to get it done. I can't necessarily focus. That's another signal inside of ourselves. You can't focus. You can't concentrate. You may be fidgety. Your legs going back and forth. You can't, you know, you're going, uh, you're staring at your computer, but you're not even necessarily, you don't even know what, it, what it's showing you. 
right? You're looking through your computer. You're daydreaming. So that's what I'm talking about. Your bodies are, they give you signals of what to pay attention to, okay? Emotions are energy. Emotions are life. I know far too many people who say, I wish I could control my emotions. I wish I didn't have these negative emotions. Except, what would life be without emotion? Dull. Dull, because with all of the ones that we label as negative, it may be anger, it may be sadness, um, disappointment, heartache, with all of those, we also have happiness and love and excitement and anticipation and the ones that we really look forward to, right? Except, here's the funny thing about our brains. We have what's called a negativity bias. Oh, big surprise, huh? Our brains are like Velcro for the negative stuff. We tend to attach to it really easily, and it gets under our skin, and it bugs us, and we ruminate and just obsess about it. Why is that? Anyone have any ideas? Because we don't really do that with happy stuff. <laughs> How long do we hold on to happy stuff? It's like there and then it's gone. Unless we're really conscious about it and we say, okay, I'm going to sink into this moment because I know it's not going to last very long. And I'm just going to sit in it and absorb in it and marinate in it because it feels so good. How many of you do that? You're that aware, you're that conscious of when you feel that good and you say, let this feeling last as long as it can. <laughs> Negative emotions have a sense of urgency attached to them. If we're feeling negative, it usually means this is something that needs to be taken care of, like right now. I, I need to pay attention to this, like right now. Does that make sense? So we attach to them that way. And it, it's really, um, it's evolutionary. It is. We had to watch out for threats in our environment. We were going to get eaten by the lion. We were being chased by the tiger. Our main goal, way, way back then, was to live. It was just to survive. And so if there was a threat, fear, anxiety, oh my gosh, you know, anticipation, there's something behind that bush, we better pay attention or we're dinner. Okay? Except in real life, today, those threats don't really exist. Are there threats? Of course there are threats, but the things that we're classifying as threats are usually not life-threatening. They aren't something that we need to ruminate about and obsess over, are they? So, I hope you guys brought a pencil and paper because I want to share with you the tool that I've developed. This is something that has kind of evolved. I, I created it as I became more immersed in what mindfulness was and, and practiced it myself. And I don't want you guys to think that this is some sort of foo-foo. Like people, sometimes people hear mindfulness and they think meditation and, and Buddhism and Eastern philosophy. And there are some roots in that, except this is not... This has none of those religious connotations to it. This is merely a process that you guys can be involved in to feel more centered, to feel more grounded, to change the way that you approach and touch and then reorder for yourself your emotions so that you can behave and think and respond in more effective ways around the areas and in the context of your lives that are so important to you. So when we look at mindfulness, it's, a, it's really a non-judgmental sort of 
awareness, okay? And when you look at it in the context of us really living in a society where we're, where we're going fast, we're eating fast, and we're not really nourishing ourselves in the way that we could with the food that we are consuming because we're eating it so quickly and we don't take the time to really savor it when we do, are we focused on this one bite that's in our mouths? Or are we focused on the bite that's after that? And when you look at it from that perspective, that's such a lack of presence. It's like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And w when you're in that sort of a mode, it's hard to enjoy what's right now, what's present for you here. How many of you get to, to the end of the day and you're like, I don't even know what happened today? I don't even remember. I wasn't present. <laughs> I think he smiled at me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember what I had to eat. Um, so here it is. This awareness means that you, you have your radar on. Okay? Imagine a radar and you're noticing the blips on the radar when things come up through the day. Not necessarily threats, just blips. The events, the people, the smiles the sound of someone's voice. I mean, to be able to sink into those very small things, you have to be awake. You have to be aware, okay? Me standing here, I'll give you just a very brief example. Standing here right now, I can be mindful in that I'm paying attention to how I'm articulating each word for you as part of this presentation, okay? That's content, really. I'm paying attention to that. I can also, though, be very mindful and aware of the fact that my heart's beating pretty quickly. Okay? I can be mindful and aware of the fact that sometimes I have a tendency to say, um, when we're talking about public speaking, there are things that you really want to pay attention to. So, that's just sort of a brief, brief example, as I'm talking to you right here, what's going on in my head? Am I getting eye contact from everyone? I mean, there are so many different things that I could be focusing on. I could be completely distracted, too, and, and, and thinking, uh, Rod thinks I'm like off of my rocker, and then I could become really crazy nervous, and that's not necessarily mindfulness, though. I'm then like, kind of obsessing and ruminating about something and making assumptions that I don't even know if they're true. And that's something that can really get in the way of, of, of eating in general and, and responding appropriately to different things in your environment. But radar, okay? The R, you notice that you're uncomfortable or you're anxious or you're nervous. The R stands for recognize. The first step in being able to become more mindful and aware is that you recognize you're, ex you're experiencing something. You may not be able to label the exact emotion, but you're aware and present enough to say, pay attention, okay? This isn't comfortable for me right now. I'm uncomfortable. If that's all you label it as, that's fine. Now you have awareness. It's here for me, okay? And with recognition comes this, when we're talking about mindfulness, it comes openness. Uh, okay, it's here. I recognize that. I'm going to open up to this experience a little bit because what is, what's our tendency when we're uncomfortable? Push it away. Avoid it. Get this away from me. Run. Go eat. Distract. I mean, we all have different ways of dealing with those uncomfortable emotions, but when we can open up to it, it loses its intensity. If we slam the door in someone's face or we yell at someone that we're in an argument with, we fight fire with fire, what happens? They yell back. It gets ugly. The same thing can happen with, with your emotions. This comes up for you. Let's, let's honor it. 
It's uncomfortable. We admit that. I don't want to necessarily sit in it. It's uncomfortable. This hurts. I, I want to run. You guys just being able to say that. I recognize this. I don't want it. I want to run away from it. That's awareness. Now you're recognizing how you're assessing the emotion. That's the A. Okay? You're assessing how you're relating to the emotion. And usually it is something like, this is aversive. I don't want this. Get me as far away from this as possible. Where are the brownies? <laughs> okay? So the A stands for assess. And instead of relating to it in this talk to the hand sort of an approach, it's more, OK, I'm going to recognize again that I'm uncomfortable, but I'm going to get a little curious about this. I'm going to see, um, let, let's just see where this leads. Because honestly, what's the worst that can happen? If I feel it, if I just kind of let it be here, what's the worst? I'm going to be OK. I am. I'm uncomfortable, but I'm OK, right? OK. So we're engaging in kind of a little bit of investigation. I wonder what this is telling me. I wonder if I direct my attention to it instead of away from it, what this emotion could share with me. Kind of a strange take, I know, but it lessens the intensity of it as you explore it a little bit. So the D then, in order to help you with the assessment, is to deepen your compassion with yourselves. How many of you, by a show of hands or a nod of heads, have been in a situation like this. You're uncomfortable. You engage in some binge eating. And on the back end of that binge eating or just overeating, you're like, why did I do that? Why? What is wrong with me? Why can't I control this? What is going on in my head? And you're blasting yourselves for the behavior. I know you guys do it because I work with a lot of you, and that's what I hear. How come I can't do this right? And it's that word, right, too. And it's what is wrong with me, and there's a whole lot of shame, and there's a whole lot of guilt. And when you engage in that sort of behavior, guys, it doesn't make you want to investigate. It doesn't make you want to be curious about the process and say, I wonder what just got in my way. I wonder how I can do this better next time. No, it makes you want to give up. It's discouraging. And if something is wrong with me and I can't do it right, then I don't even need to try. So this piece of it is about changing your language a bit and changing the way that you not only approach the emotion, but the way that you approach yourselves with more acceptance because you're humans. You're going to have emotions and, and we can't avoid them and we can't avoid pain. I heard a, a definition of suffering that I really, really love. Be, and, and I think this applies in this situation. We end up on the back end of a binge, and it really does feel like we're suffering, right? It's pain plus resistance equals suffering. The harder we try to resist pain is when we suffer the most. The next A, guys, stands for accepting the experience. 
with mindfulness we create a spaciousness. We give the emotion a space. We create a space for it. The way that I like to look at this is like the um, we hold a container for our emotions. You know, I had a, a, a client in one of my previous lectures who said, you know, I, I worry that in the way that you're talking about this, Corey, that I'm just going to, if I, if I sink into the emotion and I feel it and um, I pay attention to it, that I'm just going to wallow in it. I'm just like, I'm not going to be able to get out of it. Like, I'm going to sink and it's going to be like quicksand. <laughs> it's not going to be like I have a life vest on and I'm, I'm buoyed back up to the top of the water. And I think a misconception with mindfulness and the reason that a lot of people move toward it is that they want to be able to clear their minds. They want to clear their, their heads and their thoughts. And that's not possible, for one thing. Okay, we go into mindfulness with a goal. We do to learn about ourselves more and to be able to accept what we're experiencing when we're experiencing it, which creates this space for us to say, I'm okay, even though I'm uncomfortable, I'm okay. The goal is really directed toward being able to, like I said, contain that emotion and not detach from it. Because that's almost like I'm going to disassociate from it and push it further away. But it's to disidentify from it. I know it's there. I feel it. It's in my body. Like my heart aches and, and my chest burns. It's there. But I don't have to be in the movie. I can be on the outside and watch the movie instead. Do you see how this is a different way of approaching and a different way of viewing and thinking what's going on inside of you? The final R of, of your radar is resource and respond. You can also say this is reflect. Any of those three R's work. <laughs> the point is at this stage of your mindfulness tool to, here's another R, reach out. When I say resource, it really is to have enough compassion for yourself in this moment that you're experiencing this emotion to find people who you trust and who care about you and who love you, who you can go to and say, I'm uncomfortable. And to get underneath sometimes what can initially surface as very hard emotions, like I'm upset, I'm angry, you know, those are very hard, but when you look underneath the surface of those, you usually find the softer emotions like fear and anxiety and pain. But it's easier to feel angry, right, than it is to hurt. And so that's what we tend to move toward. When we're upset, we're going to get angry instead of getting into those softer, more primary emotions. And that's really what helps us when we're able to go there to accept the experience more and to be able to say, gosh, sometimes it's really surprising. I didn't even know that that's what was occurring for me. And so this is an experience in, uh, an experience in being able to say, uh, wow, uh, for so long I've been using food to mask things that I really needed to know about myself. I needed to touch that emotion, but be able to reorder it and reorient around it in a way that has me feeling 
a bit more grounded and centered and not thinking that something is wrong with me, but that will give me the capacity to move forward in a more effective way. So we've got our radar, and I hope that you can take that tool with you and in the moments that you're experiencing discomfort, particularly around food in this situation, when you feel yourself drawn towards eating, instead of paying attention to where you need to direct your attention to, that you can use this to settle in a bit and just take a little bit more time to slow down and pay attention. So I want to thank you guys for joining me. Thank you to everyone who is joining me live from afar. And uh, I am recording this video, so I will have this up on our Pow How studio so you can view it at your convenience. And if you do have questions or just comments and you want to shoot back and forth with me about what I talked about tonight, please feel free to email me. Uh, you can find my email on the website. So thank you.